So let's dive into emails that land meetings in the federal market, right? So this is really important to me that you start having more meetings. Um, this topic in particular today comes from a, a current customer, right? We run a business development accelerator workshop. And in that workshop, we we're having a meeting with a customer that, about some other stuff, but they brought up the fact that they were going after a couple of recompetes. These means opportunities that they, they knew details about, they knew the contracting officer, and they were trying to get information and get a, a meeting. Um, and they were asking my opinion about, hey, I'm not getting feedback or I'm not getting responses or anything to the emails. What do you think we're doing? I asked them to share their email, share the screen, show me the email. And the first thing I said was, whoa, you know, like let's cut out 70, 80 percent of what's in there. Um, and sometimes when we look at emails and we wonder why aren't we getting somebody to follow back up with us? Why do we get ignored when we reach out to the federal buyers? I would argue uh, most times it's us. It's something we can do to improve it. I describe this as um, taking responsibility in order to gain control. When you take responsibility for whether your emails are getting answered or not, then you're in control of writing perhaps a, a, a better or a more successful email rather than putting them in control of eventually deciding to get back to you, right? Um, so maybe that's you. Maybe you're sending emails, you're feeling ignored. Maybe you're feeling uh, you know, rejected, like they're just flat out rejecting you. And I don't mean um, rejected in a good way, because I'm going to talk about that later, but just rejected uh, out of hand. Well, sometimes that's because of what's in our email. More often than not, it is. And then the last one is not really getting what you want. And this is the one I very much want to dive into, is this idea that we reach out and we get lucky and they respond, but what they respond with is not really what we want. And that tends to be because we gave them an option that was not our best option. Uh, right next to our best option, they, they chose something else. Um, so we'll talk about that and how to avoid that in today's training. Um, I, I'm going to be talking about emails and I'll talk about other marketing assets just to put it in perspective, but everything has its purpose. And I want to talk to you about uh, what those purposes are and, and make sure that you know what the purpose is, in particular, the purpose for an email. Um, I want to then go into the best ways to get email open. There's certain things you can do to get emails open or increase your likelihood of getting them open. And I don't mean some fancy a uh, secret or hack or any of that kind of stuff. I just mean uh, real basic tactical things you can do, skills you can develop that will increase your likelihood of getting emails open, right? Not, not hey, put the right subject line in. Like, it's not about that. Um, and then not, number three, going with that, right? Is I want to give you 10, I think it's 10 email guidelines. I, I wrote in the original post for this event that I was going to tell you about top mistakes but I just spun it around and said, well, let me give you guidelines. And the guidelines are how to avoid the top mistakes. Uh, and then I'm going to end up with giving you an email sample. I want to show you this email sample. And what do I mean about, you know, what would an email look like in order to get land uh, to land your meetings? So we got a lot to go on. That's what we're going to dive into. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I'm the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. And I want to welcome you to my federal sales training where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal, in the federal market as a small business owner um, on the IT professional services side. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret, it's a process. When we follow a process A to Z, we have repeatable, predictable results. It's the reason, if you're looking at my screen, why I show you our seven-step process that we have um, for success in federal government, for revenue success is what I'm really looking for. So when you follow a process like we've defined here, you have repeatable, predictable revenue. Um, and so that's why you're always hearing me talk about uh, process. I love process because once we learn it, we just repeat it over and over again to achieve the same result. Um, if you haven't done this already, part of our process is to put our company name into the chat or comments, um, even if you're coming into the replay, right? Hopefully you're live so you can engage with other people, but put your company name and core competency into the chat. Two or three words is really all you need. The more stuff you put in there, the harder it is for somebody to stop and get it. This is actually the whole point of my email uh, training today is you, you don't want it to be so full that they can't get what they, uh, they can't get the meat of your message in, in a split second. And it's the same thing in chats and training like this. You really want us to know your company name, know what you do best. So then we go, oh, let me follow up. You do workforce development. Oh, you're in San Antonio, Texas. So am I, you know, let's connect. And then one last thing, if you could do me a favor, let me know if you're um, one of the small business designations, uh, 8A, Hubs Owned, Woman Owned, or Service Disabled Veteran Owned. Just put that in the chat. Um, I just really like to track on that occasionally, see who's coming into our training. We typically get about um, 70 to 100 people live every day. 
and then a bunch of people coming afterwards. And it's important for me to be able to communicate that back to the government so that I can maybe get them to give us access to more and more information, which basically helps you do your job. All right. So I teach at a fire hose pace. Uh, hang on. And we're going to dive into uh, beginning with understanding the purpose of, of the marketing assets that I've laid out here. So I have 10 of them. Um, but the idea is that everything you do as, as it relates to government sales, federal sales, has a purpose. Um, it's a journey that you're going to. You're beginning and at the end, at the end is a sale. And so there's this journey and the journey is not a jump. It's a bunch of steps. And so understanding the purpose of each step will enable you to have more success at each one of those. Um, so as we go forward, I'm going to talk about, um, for example, number one, small business profile, right? DSBS. I talk about this all the time because it's the most important thing you can do for your business is to have a squared away small business profile. But its purpose is to get you found. Um, we, we describe visibility as getting found and being attractive. Getting found means if somebody is looking for a plumber and you're a plumber, they find you. Being attractive, uh, your marketing assets will scream that you're a plumber, right? And so right here, what I want to point out, though, is that the purpose of the profile is to get you found um, somewhere. Sometimes I say or not. And the point is um, not everybody is going to work with you. Not everybody will want to meet with you, et cetera. I've, I've done training previously on... Um, a bell curve. And basically half the people you try to talk to are not going to work with you and half will. If you think about it from a gold mine standpoint, half of them will be gold and half of them will be dirt. A gold mine needs dirt and gold, right? And it doesn't mean either one are bad because dirt is soil and soil gives us crops and allows us to eat. So it's not bad. It's just not gold. Um, so people are going to be yes or no. And that's totally fine as you go forward. So um, the first thing you do when you do outreach though, is number two and three here. You, you, call, you leave a voicemail, maybe you get them, or you send an email follow-up. The purpose of these is to just get a meeting. And I'm going to describe a lot more detail as we go forward in the email, but understand its purpose is to get a meeting. It's not to inform. It's not to have this whole big discussion. It's not to sell or close a deal. It's just to get a meeting. That's the step in the journey that you're moving forward. Um, you have capability statement, right? Its purpose again is to get a meeting or if somebody's looking at it for them to look and go, tell me more right? Introduction call. When you actually have that first meeting, it's not to sell. It's not even really to inform a ton. It's to establish a relationship. And I go into separate training on each one of these, but it's just to establish a relationship because through that relationship, will you have many more meetings where you can begin to inform them. But if you try to shove in an informational training session into an introduction meeting, then you won't build a relationship. So maybe you get to inform that one meeting, but there's no desire to have a second meeting or a 50th. And so in there, um, you want to establish a relationship. LinkedIn, uh, the LinkedIn personal profile I just showed you or your company page, this is about credibility. Somebody's going to look in if you want to connect with them and go, well, who's Jane Smith? And they go look at you and they realize, okay, Jane Smith, she does this. Like she said, she does. She's been here and here, went to this school or something. Okay, credibility. I have a, a level of comfort to engage with you further. Uh, I describe it as no liking and trusting, right? People do business with those they know, like, and trust. LinkedIn is one of those things that helps people know you, right? That credibility is just knowing who you are. Number eight is capability briefing deck. We teach this, that um, it's not an hour deck to inform. It's a it's really like a five minute, 10 minute max uh, briefing deck to get the meeting started. How about I just do a quick intro, slide, 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 and then we get into the discussion. The whole point of the briefing deck really is to guide that discussion, to lead to the discussion. So then you're doing sales, you're having a conversation. Um, company website, number nine and blogs, et cetera, their job is to inform. So I might go to your website and I can see your services and then I can see your blog and the articles you've written in there. And that helps me become smarter. If I'm doing uh, requirements, understanding or something, I can learn from your company and from you by reading things like that on your website. So understand that everything has its purpose. Um, and in particular emails, right? The purpose is to get a meeting. It's nothing else. Okay, let's talk about the best ways to get an email open. And I want to go through this very quickly, but I will tell you, I've got at least five other trainings that go into this very topic. How do you warm up leads? How do you start a relationship before the first meeting? How do you start that? 
So go watch a lot of the training. My team might dump some of the links in, but really you should go to um, look at my profile, my LinkedIn profile, and it lists out the 325 plus uh, trainings we've done in the last 15 months on these topics of federal sales. So you can find me expanding on that. But one of the best ways to get an email open is to not make the email the very first thing they see about you, right? I don't want to get an email and go, well, who's this? And, and that happens a lot. I actually reject um, LinkedIn connections. I have a lot of connections and, and you'd be amazed how many I reject. And one of the reasons I reject is when somebody sends me something and I look at it and it, and it doesn't scream any kind of commonality and they don't send me a message or something. And so I don't know who they are. Well, they could have warmed that up by engaging me in some of the training, some of my content. Then I would have known they've been following me. And I was like, oh, cool, I'll connect with you. I mean, I'm not that stingy with my con uh, connection requests, right? But you can warm leads up. And so that's what I talk about on, on number two here. One way to warm somebody up is to engage them on LinkedIn. Uh, just give them a thumbs up, uh, go into their, especially federal agencies, if they're popping out strategic documents or they're uh, the, like the Department of Navy CIOs constantly, that shop is constantly on LinkedIn, many other people. Well, you can engage them in there and engagement means giving a thumbs up to some of their posts or coming in and putting a relevant comment that moves the dialogue forward on that LinkedIn post, whole separate training, right? But when you engage with them, they see you. And so that way, if you send them a message or an email, it's not the first time they saw your name. They're like, oh yeah, they were that person was engaging, right? I'm at least gonna look at their email and now I'll probably reply. Whether I reply yes or no, that's secondary, right? Dirt, gold, but at least they know who you are. Number three, another way to get um, emails open is to get an introduction. So this is my biggest value that a small business specialist inside the government can do is, hey, can you make an introduction to um, somebody else? I do this all the time on LinkedIn for people. I make introductions to folks. My favorite thing to do is because I have over 20,000 connections my favorite is to reach out to people I don't really know. I don't know all 20,000 of them personally, right? But I love reaching out on your behalf and, and don't send me a flood of requests. But like for people who are engaged a lot and they say, hey, Neil, can you, do you know this person? I'm like, I don't really know them, but I got no problem making an introduction because there's no stake in my game uh, or I have no stake in that game, right? I'm introducing Jane to John and saying, hey, John, would you be open to meeting one of my connections? Well, I'm already kind of uh, having a relationship with you that we're connected. It's not a tight relationship, but every single time John comes back and says, absolutely, happy to talk to them, right? And so I'm asking you, have you done that on LinkedIn? Have you uh, made a practice of trying to make introductions for others with no expectation for your own benefit? Um, name drop. Number four is just uh, name dropping. If I'm meeting with a small business specialist or contracting officer, and then I'm going to call the program office, but they haven't made an introduction, I can just say, hey, I was talking with Sally, contracting officer. She said, John's, you know, you're the program manager. And I'd love to just connect, get, you know, 15 minutes of your time or, you know, a brief amount of time uh, with you. But I'm name dropping that KO or the small business specialist, et cetera. And I ask, by the way, I ask uh, the, the person I'm name dropping. I'm like, well, if you're not doing the introduction, do you mind if I say I got your name from you? Sure. And so once I do that, now I'm at a whole different level than a completely cold email. And the last one is if you have nothing like that, you can just reference stuff. If you're trying to reach out to uh, Sally May, <laughs> I don't know why I chose that name, but if you're trying to reach out to Sally May, do some research, see what they've done on the internet. Have they participated in briefings? Are they on YouTube or LinkedIn? Have they um, have they recently won an award? I've seen that before where like whole teams have won an award and Sally May might be one of them. I reach out and that's how I open it up. I'm like, hey, I, I, I uh, congratulations on that award you won, blah whatever that is. And now I've kind of broken the ice for a second. And then I ask my brief question in the email. That's a, a way to potentially get those emails open. So these are just some tips on how to succeed, um, but there are skill tips, right? There are no secrets out there. Uh, really quickly, I just wanted to make sure I'm pointing out every single training day that we have our website with a ton more information out there. So go there, govconchamber.com. You can see it theoretically on this post. But uh, today, what I put on the left is the vendor supplier portal. If you don't know that we have this, it's a free directory. Go download it. It has 100 plus supplier portals that are agency or large prime supplier portals. So we have DSBS and SAM. That's the overall federal government. But these places like NavAir or uh, Boeing, they have their own supplier portals. That's where they look first. For any 8A small business that's trying to get end of the year direct awards, 
you need to be in every one of these. When we work with our customers, we go in and quickly either get them to do it if they've got the resources or we do it really quick ourselves for them because it just increases your visibility. So download that directory. It's free off our website. Go register in, especially in the um, agencies and the large primes that are valuable to you. Uh, I get people asking me about what's in the membership, et cetera. The biggest thing about the sustaining membership is that you're just helping us continue to do this for everybody for free. But if you go click on membership, you'll see this huge page we put in there that describes all the extra value you actually get as a sustaining member. Um, it's like $16,000 in value. It is very valuable. Uh, no pressure, but when you're ready to support us, support us. All right, let's dive into the last two slides. And I'm because I'm watching my time. I end at 1230 every day. I want to move into email guidelines for uh, that you should follow when writing emails to large primes or agencies for the first time, or even small, excuse me, or even small businesses, right? When you're reaching out, I want you to keep these uh, best practices in mind. Email guidelines is what I wrote. And you can figure that every one of them is aligned to a top mistake that uh, we sometimes make. So the first one, for example, uh, a guideline when you're writing emails, especially first emails, what I would really say every email is don't sell. Don't sell in your email. Nothing is giving you permission to uh, sell. Nothing in the relationship, since it hasn't started yet, makes you realize that the other person wants to hear your sales pitch. And most importantly, when you sell in a first email, that's a, it's um, pretty much 99% of us are just going to reject it. We're, like, we're, we're out of here. And the reason is because nobody cares what you know or what you sell. Nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. And so you want to be starting the opposite of, of selling, right? Is you want to be coming at them from a, I care about you. I want to learn more about you. I read your strategic document, whatever it is. They want to know, I want to know that you care about me before you start trying to pitch me, right? Um, second one is only have one ask. This one's a really uh, important thing. By the way, as we're going along, if, if you feel comfortable doing this, put these tips one at a time into the chat. It reinforces it for you and for others to come in, but like, don't sell. Second tip, only have one ask. This is a big mistake that we make is, um, and this goes back to something I said at the very early part of this training, is sometimes somebody will come back and give us something, but it's not what we really wanted. Well, it's because we had more than one ask. And an ask is, for example, I want a meeting. I would like to have an introduction meeting with you. You want to make sure your email only has one ask, one thing, drive, help drive them right to the decision you want them to make. And it's totally okay if the decision is no, right? You're asking for the meeting, the meeting, the answer should be yes or no. And, uh, and you're done. What you don't want is to try to drive for a meeting and some of your extra uh, content in the email is got something else. So they don't say yes or no. They say, oh, Bob's blue trucks or whatever. I, I don't have a good example there, right? But the whole point is when you have one ask, you make it really easy for them to answer the question for you and you can move on or have the meeting. Number three, uh, when you have that one ask, give them choices. Don't, uh, don't have, and I say this down below in number seven, don't have an open thing saying, hey, what time's good for you? Let me know, uh, you know how we can schedule this. That doesn't work. You'll see it in my email template that I'll show you um, or email sample that I'll show you. But you want to give them uh, choices so that they can just pick off a menu. So here I said, how about Tuesday or Thursday? How about 10 a.m. or 2 p.m.? And what I, I think what I write in my sample is, if it's convenient for you, avail it's, if it's convenient for you, I'm available on Tuesday or Thursday of next week at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m. East Coast. Let me know. And now what I'm trying to do is to encourage them to pick one of those. And, I'm, and we call this reducing the friction. If I tell them we've got to coordinate a coordinated uh, schedule, I don't like doing that, right? Um, I, the, it gets crazy. I'm like, well, I'll get back to that. I got to look at my calendar. I got to talk to other people. But if all I have to do is pick, I can look. Eh, Thursday at two o'clock works for me. Okay. Number four, um, remove all the distractions from the main purpose. And this is just reinforcing the idea of only have one ask. But um, the main purpose of this first email to try to get a meeting well, is to get a meeting, right? The main purpose is to get a meeting. So anything else you have in there, for example, our company does this and this and this, who cares? <laughs> like At the moment, it doesn't matter. You can slide one teeny line in if you want, um, but generally who cares because you're trying to have a meeting. And here's another thing that goes back to number three, right? Uh, no, no, sorry, not number three, but um, 
Well, I said it up above, but this idea that they choose the they uh, they reject you, right? And they and they send you somewhere else. So if you say, for example, and I made this mistake on number four, where remove all distractions from main purpose. My main purpose was just get in a meeting so I could talk and introduce you, uh, my company or my customer's company. And when we reached out, we made the mistake in the email of talking about. Uh, we did supply chain and logistics, but we made this mistake of talking about data and, and cyber or something uh, or data and, and cloud. And really, and so the minute they got it, they're like, oh, that's not us. You can't talk to us. You need to talk to this person. They do all of IT for DLA. And it was like, what the hell? We just we got rejected out of hand. And it's like, we don't want to talk to IT. We're not an IT company. We are a supply chain logistics company. And IT is an enabler to us doing that but we're experts at supply chain. Well, because I had extra stuff in there, number four, I gave them a distraction from the main purpose of just trying to schedule that meeting. And they use that distraction to um, go away from what I wanted. So number five, right? And this a little bit goes back to it. Be direct. My very, when you look at the uh, sample I'm going to do, I say, I want to have a meeting. Don't make it hard for them to understand what you want. Uh, when I took a job uh, a while ago, but I was VP of uh, sales for a little while for a company who was trying to get in the government space. And when I took that, one of the things I said to them was, I need my card to say VP of sales. Like they just said VP for all these people. I was like, I need it to be VP of sales so that when I talk to somebody I, and hand them my card, I want them to look and go, oh, he's going to sell me something. I am. I'm not, not, I'm not going to do it hard, but I am going to sell it to you. Well, your email should be that same way. When they look at it, you want them to go, oh, he wants a meeting with me. That's exactly what I want. Let's schedule it on Tuesday or Thursday at 10 or 2. Um, number six, be concise. Uh, more than my training, but be concise, right? Very short sentences. I'll show you an example in a second. But when you're concise, it makes it easy to read. Nowadays, write emails the same way we write posts on um, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever. You know what you like to read. Short, choppy uh, sentences that very small and not a lot of um, lines per paragraph type thing, right? And so be that same way. Look at whatever you're writing and go, how can I cut it by 50% to drive to the one ask? Number seven, um, avoid open questions. And so that goes back to the scheduling, but don't ask questions that allow them to go in this direction, that direction, this direction. In emails like this, you want closed questions. You want them to say yes or no. Again, both of those are perfectly acceptable and desired answers. What I don't want is for them to go, well, what are you doing over here and what's going on? Because it makes it harder to get what I want, which is the meeting, which is where I'll ask open questions. Um, number eight, minimize the chit chat and, and large signature lines. And so most importantly, I've seen people in, in, in this customer I was talking about earlier on, they'll write an email and they'll have this whole paragraph in the beginning about, oh, hey, I hope you're doing well and all this kind of stuff. It's like, I know I'm going to sound brutal here, but who cares? Like, like it's business. We're jumping in. It doesn't mean when you get on the call with them, you can't sit there and ask them about their life and be polite. Although I do try to drive you straight to the meeting. Um, but the idea is you're trying to get to the meeting. I'm not opening a business email from somebody I really don't even know and have them ask me how I am. Who cares? I, like, if I got time to answer that question, I'll answer it for somebody else. And again, I don't mean to sound brutal. I just mean to sound efficient. And in this particular case, efficiency is fine. Then the last one is make it easy to say yes or no, right? So this conciseness way, having one ask, you're making it very easy for them to respond to that email instead of disappearing. So let me just show you a quick example. I got this slide twice. I just want to show you this sample that I'm going to show you. It's very small, right? You look at it, you imagine it on a phone. It's very small um, content. I got it zoomed in, but that's uh, limited. So let me go in. It's the same email here, just bigger so we can all see it. Um, and I only got two minutes left and I really want to drive forward. So if you look at the subject line, I make it direct, right? Request for intro call. I'm not trying to make it fancy or, or a tricky or a hooky or any of that stuff. I'm just trying to say I'm requesting an intro call. And generally when I'm sending it to people, they'll get all this. They'll understand that and either reject it or not reject it. Um, and then right from the beginning, I just start. Hi, Jane. You know, I personally use first names. I'm a I rebel against authority kind of thing, but um, you use what you're, what's comfortable, but just hi, um, something like that. And then, I, and then I have these three lines, right? My company has been supporting the Army for the past several years and hope to increase our support. Would you be open to a brief intro call for me next or with me next week so I can seek your guidance? Um, if convenient, I'm free 1030 to 130 Eastern on Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. So I expanded that a little bit for this particular uh, example. 
when you look at it, the first thing I'm trying to establish with that first paragraph, and if you don't have experience, that's okay. You can tweak that or even eliminate it. But the first thing I'm establishing with that first line is just to say, hey, I've been in the GovCom world for a while supporting agencies. Credibility, right? Establishing credibility. And then I dive straight to the ask, would you be open to a brief intro call with me next week? Um, and then the last paragraph that I use, if convenient, I'm free 1030 or 130, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Let me know, right? It is very direct. People can modify it any way. You can copy this and modify it any way you want. But the reality is the, um, the cleanness of it makes it very easy for somebody to look at on their phone while they're in a meeting and someone's talking and they're going through their emails. They can respond. Hey, that's not me. Or, you know, maybe it's uh, Sally or sure. Sounds good. Um, you know, Tuesday at 1.30, send me an invite. That kind of stuff. If you send emails this concise, you will begin to find that people open them and get back to you. But remember, not every email is going to get a response. Half the people won't even respond to you. And then half the people who respond to you will say yes or no, um, depending on what it is, right? And so half of them are going to say no. That's totally okay. But if you want to increase the amount of people responding to you, if you want to increase the number saying yes, then just make sure you warm up the leads before reaching out to them the way I suggested early on. Um, by the way, we do this training every single day. If you don't know this, come back in, look at my profile. You see other events that we do. Again, if you're getting value, become a sustaining member. Help us uh, do this for everybody out there. We don't take government funds. This is self-funded and sustaining members support us. For everybody, remember, government contracting, it's not a secret. It's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.